Guys, welcome to another fun episode of TFL Talking Trucks. I am Andre Smirnov with the Fast Lane Truck, and my co-host Roman is actually towing a trailer over a mountain right now, so he wasn't able to join us. Uh, but we have a very fun conversation today with Jonathan, and it all has to do with stereo system, audio system tuning, um, and things that I want to learn about, so I'm hoping you can learn about it with me. So Jonathan, welcome and uh, introduce yourself, please. Hey, well, thank you, Andre. I'm happy to be here. So my name is Jonathan Pierce. I am the Senior Manager of Global Experiential R&D at Harman, and that's obviously a mouthful. Uh, but for those of you who aren't familiar with the name Harman, uh, we have the, a suite of brands that you might you know, recognize, such as Harman Kardon, JBL, Mark Levinson, and uh, we would be the largest tier one supplier of branded automotive audio. So yeah, I mean, this is uh, talking trucks, but right. I want to kind of make it a little bit more generic and make this um, conversation um, more about focused on the stereo systems, sure. but we can go over some trucks as well, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, uh, we certainly supply to many different auto lines, uh, Ram being one of them, Toyota, obviously, um, Ford, another one. So yeah, we can talk about trucks all you want. Thank you for joining TFL Talking Trucks podcast. If you love pickup trucks or big full-size SUVs, if you love trailering, towing, and going off-road, this is the right place to be. Together, we can make this podcast the most popular ever. So where do we begin? I mean, uh, stereo systems are getting you know, more fancy, more sophisticated. Uh, their speaker counts are going up. Yeah. Uh, their power levels are going up. Uh, so as a consumer or of a car or a truck, what should people kind of look for um, in a premium system? Right. Yeah, I think there's a lot of confusion out there. And we also have to recognize that the market itself has kind of shifted from maybe when, you know, yourself, when you were younger, when I was younger, you know, my father was someone who would actually buy a receiver and expensive speakers and go buy cables and tinker and EQs and all that. And I think there was a general understanding of what made good sound. And people were more familiar with tone controls and fade and balance, right? And, and the features that came within how to create a great home audio system. And then I think we saw with car audio coming into you know, the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, a lot of those features were being integrated into radio head units. We actually had physical knobs where you could again, fade and balance and, and, and steer the sound, so to speak, and adjust the, the tone controls like bass, mid range, and treble. I think as we're ushering into a new era, you know, we're finding that there's generations now that never really were afforded that opportunity, that not many people actually go and seek out the, that type of equipment and have that DIY mentality at home. They're looking more for convenience and Bluetooth speakers. And I just want to take my phone, right? And then sync it up to my speaker and then just enjoy my music that way. So, you know, we as an uh, audio supplier are trying to understand how those generations want to be enjoying their music, right? And give them the control that they seek without losing, I think, that premium experience as well. So as, again, we continue to pack more and more speakers into these systems, we have to be mindful of people still want to be able to control that music. They want to customize their sound. So we have to make it in a way I think that's palatable to them and understandable, uh, but also give them the convenience, right, that they're looking for too. And I think you're mentioning things like, um, you know, a lot of modern systems offer you, well, not just control, you know, where this sound is coming from. So, mm -hmm. you know, front, back, side to side, yeah. fade, etc. but also like surround system settings, right? Right. Or, a, you know, different kind of, you know, popular music versus rock and roll versus right. whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, a talk show like this, right? Absolutely. Yeah. A podcast. Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so how do we, uh, how do people kind of listen for that? You know, what, what are you listening to? Yeah, so that's a great question. So a big part of my responsibility at Harman is to actually lead a team of trained listeners. So anyone who uh, you know becomes a Harman employee essentially can go through this training and we seek out folks who are not in the acoustic engineering department. And with over about 20,000 employees to choose from globally, you know, you, we have a pretty wide pool of people that uh, aren't acoustic engineers that can join the program. And the point there really is trying to get people to embrace their enjoyment of music, but also understand when you listen to something and you like it or dislike it, how do you describe that, right? The terminology of how we talk about sound is not something that we inherently just grow up with. Uh, I compare it to how I watch TV. You know, I get a brand new TV and all of a sudden there's gamma settings and, and hues and things like that. That's just foreign to me and because it's not really my passion, but there are video people certainly who know those terms. When it comes to audio, right, we start talking about, you know, true harmonic distortions and frequency responses. That's my language. But uh, going back to what I'm responsible for doing is taking these individuals and essentially 
actually equipping them with the language so when they hear sound in a car, they can describe what they like or dislike about it, give a score, and then we can, we can quantify all that, right, the qualitative data, and then we can give that information to our engineers to say, hey, you know, the large sample of our trained listeners are hearing that there might be a peak in the upper mid-range because I see comments like harsh and shouty. So can you guys go back and look at your microphone measurements and see if you do indeed have a correlation with that and then make those changes? And again, I think we're trying to make this educative push now out into uh, more of the consumer space, whether it's the media or actually interacting with state dealer trainers to really educate people as to how they can enjoy an audio system to the fullest and be able to identify what the benefits are and the drawbacks of those systems as well. Uh, and again, there's, there's so many uh, complications to that, right? I mean, there's like this cycle of confusion that we commonly refer to as to how the music is created and the source that you're listening to, whether it's satellite radio, whether it's Spotify, whether it's something like Tidal, right, which is CD streaming. Um, there's just a lot of choices out there for consumers and we wouldn't expect them to know, right, which one is the best. So we're always trying to push to give people that expertise Okay, so kind of before we unravel a little bit further, um, here at, at the Fastlane Truck and Fastlane Car, we don't uh, usually um, review stereo systems. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons it's kind of silly is because when, when on the road, a um, new debut event or something else happening, there's usually copywritten music materials. Right. right. <laughs> so yeah. we can't right. really review that and say, oh, listen to that and you know that sure. sounds great or sure. bad yeah. or whatever. Sure, it makes complete um, sense. But we want to move in that direction and obviously mm -hmm. have a certain library of music mm -hmm. uh, that we can review depending on each vehicle that we're in. Yeah. Um, and then, um, so before we kind of switch gears to that, um, can you describe a little bit more how you at Harman um, interact with automotive manufacturers. So oh, can, sure. can you give me a couple examples on what is that development process like, uh, be it a truck or maybe a car? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, every automaker has a different characteristic. You know, to some automakers, audio is, a, we'll say, a pillar for them. And we might be one of uh, the, the, the top three things that they're looking to highlight when this system comes out. And that's a very different interaction, right, from, say, an automaker that maybe has other priorities, you know, for, for that particular program. Um, but we are there years in advance attempting to work with their CAD designers, right? When, when really, honestly, after the, car, after the car comes off of the clay modeling table, we're trying to say, we want to put speakers here and put speakers there. And we're oftentimes, obviously, fighting with safety, safety mechanisms in the car. Uh, we're fighting with HVAC systems in the car. And so oftentimes we, we know what we think is optimal for sound quality where those speakers should go. And we'll think it's a home run to say, well, of course, everybody should know this, right? We'll put this here. We'll get the pushback, obviously, from the CAD team saying, I'm sorry, um, the, the airbag goes there. And that's a bit more important than the sound quality. I think we probably all agree, right? Yes. Uh, so it's a push and a pull. And again, I think every automaker has a bit of a different uh, priority, I think, when it comes to what they're willing to concede, you know, as far as where we're going to put these speakers. But we often times find that if you come with data, right? So if you have a process for measuring sound quality, uh, subjectively and objectively, if you will, being with human ears and with microphones, and you, you come with a thoughtful proposal, uh, all automakers, right, are going to listen to data, right, to, to some degree. And it's just about how, um, how uh, confident are you in, in fighting for that, that process by using that data. Okay. And a lot of the systems, I mean, these are sort of either optional systems in some cases. I mean, mm -hmm. some cases they're not. I mean, they're kind of built into the vehicle. Um, can you give me a more, more specific example? Uh, for example, like maybe like a Ram 1500 truck or maybe another mm -hmm. vehicle. Uh, how's that development um, with that particular manufacturer or vehicle? How does that go? Yeah, well, FCA knew immediately, you know, that they wanted to do something very special in the Ram. And uh, this was, this is kind of a great story actually to lead into because uh, I got the, uh, the advantage or the opportunity, I should say, to work with Dave Cobb, who's a very, very famous Nashville producer, right? And to meet him, he came into our facility one time to actually hear the Ram. And I think those of you who have gone online, you've seen that uh, Dave had, you know, a good influence on the way that this, this truck sounds. And I'm not sure if who else would be a better spokesperson? I know that he is a, a Ram uh, enthusiast. He owns, you know, the brand himself. And uh, he came in and he heard the truck and he gave some suggestions based on some of actually his master recordings that he brought in as well, right, and mm -hmm. listened to. So here's a gentleman who knows how it's supposed to sound in the studio and how it's supposed to sound in the car. And being able to work with him right, and our engineers and understanding 
how really it's supposed to be if you're talking about the artist intent, right? And that's really kind of our goal is, as a audio reproduction supplier, if you will, is to take whatever they create in that studio and try to faithfully reproduce it. To have someone right there who has heard it maybe as early as a day before and now they're sitting in the vehicle really went, went a long way, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, again, uh, you know, the Ram engineers had that same vision. And I think there's this idea that most uh, truck drivers like country music, right? I mean, I don't know that there's really any data out there to say that's definitive, but I think <laughs> that certainly, you know, Dave representing, you know, that genre and being kind of like the next up and coming uh, um, producer, right? That, that since they're on that uh, Nashville road, you know, that, that uh, Studio One road, then I, I think that there's really no better partnership, you know, between uh, Harmon and, and Dave and obviously uh, Ram to execute that. Yeah, so so then um, you have this uh, now premium truck. Uh, so mm -hmm. the uh, I believe Harman Kardon system in the Ram 1500 is available. You mm -hmm. know, in the Ram Rebel and more luxurious trim levels like the Laramie yeah. uh, Longhorn and the Limited trucks. Right. Uh, and this this is how many speakers are there? Like a thousand? Uh, how many, how many <laughs> it might thousand? seem like it. There's 19 speakers in there. Okay. Yeah. And we're packing 900 watts of power in there as well, right? So should be enough to satisfy, uh, I think, uh, most people, you know, who are uh, the ardent audiophile, if you will. And something else we've done that's unique in this is you'll look at the ornate grills, right? So the industrial design as well. And so I've been in this business for 17 years and, you know, kind of circling back, speakers used to, used to be something that they put behind a bunch of plastic that was almost intended to be not noticeable, except for maybe a little badge somewhere that we fought to put on the car. And it's really evolved now into something that's really more of a total experience. It's not just about how good it sounds. It's also the visual part of it being something that you're proud of when you open the door and you see this, you know, uh, brushed aluminum grill or chrome or whatever that's going to be, that's going to catch your attention. The shine of the sun's going to hit it at the right angle and something that your neighbors also might be jealous about too. Right? So it's, it, it's also incorporating some of that aspect. So when you sit into that, that premium 19 speaker system, the first thing you're going to notice is, oh, wow, the presentation, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I feel is really changing our industry a little bit, is, is getting more of that industrial design aspect. And at Harman, we actually have in-house design teams that work with our OEs, right? So we have artists at drafting tables, essentially, that are coming up with some of these ideas and trying to understand the Harman Kardon characteristic mating up with, say, the Ram characteristic. Because obviously, Ram has their own idea of kind of the character of the car they're looking for, the demographic of the buyer. And then we work within that and, and the signature of our characteristic being Harman Kardon and trying to find out where that sweet spot is between the two companies. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And um, I mean, in the Ram specifically, I mean, you have speakers, you know, some of them are up high, right? Some, some of them are in the ceiling. Yeah. Uh, some of them are in the doors, obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how's that process? I mean, it sounds like very complicated. It is. It is. And let's, let's be honest here. A, an automotive cabin is not a great place to listen to music. If you're talking about just where you're sitting and the reflections and the geometrical properties everywhere. If we go back to how music is created, I mean, we sit in, in rooms or not, I guess I don't and you don't, but in music engineers and producers and artists do, they sit in control rooms that are what we say free of reflections. So glass, when sound hits glass, it bounces all over the cabin and mm -hmm. that causes what we call colorations. And that essentially distorts the sound that, that would be, be coming out of your speakers and therefore distorts the vision of the artist in general. And you're also not sitting what we say on axis. So if you sit between two speakers symmetrically like they do in say a recording studio, those speakers are firing right at your ears at the same time. In a car, that's obviously not happening. You've got cars that are almost you know, 80, 90 degrees off axis. So we have to engineer these speakers to work optimally, not just firing right at your face, but also firing up say from the floor, like say from a door woofer. And then also mid ranges mounted on the dashboard. You know, there's a windshield there. It's gonna fire right into that windshield and then scatter all over the car. So how do we minimize some of that? How do we control some of that? And we do that through a lot of DSP or digital signal processing. And, and this is something, again, that since I've come into the industry has really transformed the opportunities that we have to optimize these systems. Everything used to be analog. It used to be you had a, a large amplifier and a lot of capacitors and resistors, and there's only so much you could really do to change the sound of each one of those speakers in the car. Now we have almost infinite choices. We can put so much EQ all over the car, but then there's always a question of the more EQ you put on it, the more you, again, you kind of color the sound, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes less is more, but not every problem is the same, right? Not, not every nail requires the same hammer, if you will, I guess, you know, to use some sort of an analogy there. Mm -hmm. So um, 
what really goes on behind the scenes to make these systems so great is something that, you know, I myself and many of your viewers maybe don't understand. It's not just about the quality of the speaker itself. We certainly employ, you know, some of the best uh, transducer engineers, at least we think so, right, in the industry. And they can design a really great speaker. And then we can put that in a car and we can walk away from it. But honestly, it's just not going to sound as, as good as it can because that speaker is going to behave depending on the sheet metal that's around it, the grill transparency that's in front of it, and whatever it's firing into, say it's a leather or a cloth seat we're firing into a windshield or a certain angle. So this is why we have engineers who actually go to the automotive plant. Uh, in this case, it would be Ram's facility. And they would sit in the car for weeks at a time. And they would sit in each one of the seats, you know, in, in the vehicle and hook a computer up to the amplifier and control each one of those speakers in the car individually. Mm -hmm. And with that control, we can modify the frequency response, which basically means that we can adjust the bass, the mid and the treble for each one of those speakers. We can control delay time. So because we're not all sitting right in the middle of the car, you know, we kind of sit off center, if you will. We have to actually tell certain speakers, hey, wait, don't play yet because these speakers need time to arrive and then we release the sound from that. So it all kind of arrives at the ears at the same time, mm -hmm. right? And, and then of course we also have features like surround sound. So we've got, we can't just do stereo where we're trying to put everything more frontal to the driver. So for those of you who are in your you know, car right now, maybe listening to this, um, if, if you're listening to music, your dashboard is essentially your performance stage, right? So whatever music you're listening to, you should picture a little singer up there, maybe some instruments spread across that dashboard between uh -huh. the left pillar and the right pillar. When you go into surround sound, now those images that are left and right to you will kind of subtly move over maybe your shoulder or maybe even behind you, again, depending on how that surround sound was implemented to either be more aggressive, more aggressively steered or something that's a bit more conservative and just maybe widens the sound stage a little bit, but not too radical. Okay. So how do you, um, I guess, let's kind of go back to how do you judge the system? So mm -hmm. what, what are some of your favorite way or genres or songs, I guess, uh, what are some of your favorite ways of judging a system like this in the RAM? Yeah, yeah. So the challenge here is, again, we, we can't make assumptions that people who buy certain cars only enjoy certain types of music because there's just simply no data out there to support that. And so I think when you, when you do this, either as a scientist, an engineer, a journalist, you want to make sure that you're capturing a wide variety of music. But, you know, you can't listen to a thousand songs in 15 minutes either. So, you know, you pick some songs, I think, more importantly, that test certain aspects of the audio system. Uh, everybody usually equates the, the bass response, the bass power as being like the measuring stick for overall audio quality. And I always remind people that there's, there's a singer in there somewhere and maybe some symbols as well so we got to make sure that we're worrying about the entire frequency range and not not just uh, having all the the bass impact right uh -huh. so we want to find tracks that measure what we call the spectral properties so spectral is going to be that frequency response that's your balance of bass mid-range and treble and and within that we're honestly looking to find you know a nice neutral bass response uh, something that represents all the notes say below 100 hertz evenly so that would be like kick drums it would be bass guitars um maybe some elements of maybe some other percussive instruments in there as well. But knowing that that information that's stored on that track, and maybe it's something you listen to on home speakers or, or other high quality headphones you own, you kind of know how it's supposed to sound. So when you hop into a vehicle, then you're listening for those little judgments. You know, does the bass guitar actually sound like it's a bit more muffled compared to the kick drum? Right? Or maybe the bass guitar sounds really, really pronounced compared to what you've heard on what you know to be, say, more of a neutral sounding system. Mm -hmm. And then we would move into more of the mid-range, which is more, more like your guitars, your vocals, piano, things like that are, are concentrated in the music. And again, same thing. You're listening for any uh, excessive cuts or boosts in some of those instruments, things that you know that shouldn't be there in that recording. And then moving again into the treble, maybe more things like cymbals, um, the airiness, uh, the kind of the space that's created around music. Mm -hmm. uh, the term that we use would be reverb. So reverb would be the difference of you, you know, clapping your hands, say, in your closet where you have all of your clothes kind of muffling the sound versus going into, uh, like, say, your bathroom where you clap your hands and you have tile surfaces and glass, right? And kind of that echo that you, that you hear, that's, that's reverb, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of that is contained uh, within that treble source. So uh, if you hear something that sounds like it's exaggerated, you know, too much of, the, of that treble, too much of that reverb, then you probably have a, a brightness, a, a boost happening there in your frequency response. Uh, moving on past that, we talk about more of the spatial elements. So spatial is something that is really fun to teach people about. 
because spatial is something that is more where you see the sound to be appearing in front of you. Uh, so I go back to stereophonic listening, you know, and, and I'm sure that you have some audio files as your listeners who uh, maybe have even outfitted their basement or in their living room. You know, they've certainly fought with their significant other, other to say, look, the speaker goes here because it has to go there. I know that I'm one of those people. And they sit between those two speakers and they're actually visualizing where certain instruments were placed in the mix. And I somewhat feel that that's a lost art today. You know, it kind of goes back to the beginning, how we were talking about uh, consumers today are looking more for convenience and, and portable uh, um, options like Bluetooth speakers. Um, but the car now is becoming the place where we can really preserve this, where we can actually adhere to what that engineer was doing in the car by saying, hey, I want the vocal to be right here in the middle, and then the guitar off center, maybe the piano over here to the right, and then the drum spread between left and right across my dash. And, and that's really part of the presentation with music that's, that's really special. And the car is now somewhere where we can be preserving that because let's face it, how many people have 19 speakers in their home? Now you have it in say like your Ram truck, right? Yeah. So now surrounding yourself with all of that, we can now preserve those elements. So as you're driving down the road, you can say, gosh, there's this singer right over my wheel. And then there's a guitar player over here to the right, maybe above my glove box. And, and that's actually really how music is created and, and intended to be listened to. And I think the car is now somewhere where we can be preserving some of that. Right. And then talking about that stereo example I just described about being frontal up on the dash and the surround sound where things now somewhat envelop you and kind of appear over your shoulder a little bit. Uh, and then the last one is dynamics. So dynamics is more your volume based issues. And we certainly want people to have the volume that, that, they, that they would expect. Uh, it's a nice day. It's Friday. You roll the windows down. Maybe you ought to raise that day. That'd be excellent. So you want a bit more right, going on. You want that experience to, to really be more impactful. You want to feel the bass. But it shouldn't get harsh or bright. right? It shouldn't actually physically hurt your ears as you turn the volume up. So harshness would describe a boost in the upper mid-range, and, and brightness would describe a boost in the treble. And that commonly happens uh, with a lot of systems as you start to turn them up. And the reason being is the amplifier itself is like, hey, look, I just can't keep giving you more and more bass power because that's really where a lot of the juice comes from. But if you want to go louder, I can give you more mid-range and more treble. And that's where, again, that curve starts to bend a little bit. And the way that our ears are, are biologically created is we're more sensitive to those upper mid-range and high frequencies. So we start to hear that, that harshness and all of a sudden you're reaching for the knob and trying to turn it down. So when you're listening to things at high volumes, listen for things like that. Do you have the bass that you want at high volumes or does the system start to sound again a bit uh, colored or, or bright or harsh? And then at low volumes, because people do enjoy podcasts these days, uh, I'm certainly one of them. Uh, we want to be, be able to make sure you can turn it down and hear the vocals and everything still sounds intelligible and doesn't get maybe overly too boomy. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, so, so um and talking about quality, right? You mentioned you, you kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, the resolution of the source you're listening to. Yeah. Right. Um, for somebody like me who doesn't know a heck of a lot in this uh, area, can you explain a little bit of that? Um, as far as it kind of matters which source you're listening to and how compressed, I guess yes. that that yes. data is. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Again, you know, with convenience comes sacrifice and digital compression is something that exists in most of our music streaming services today. And some are, are worse than others. Um, I think with everybody migrating to an app on their phone, it actually truly in the last five years, we've seen an uptick in sound quality, even just uh, without going into the app and changing all the settings, you know. So like your Pandora, Spotify, uh, iTunes, I see satellite radio has also been introducing an app, which is really great. Um, most of them have settings within them to where you can change the amount of data essentially that you're downloading to the app and then streaming in through your car. And I would say that for the vast majority of people listening on the normal setting or default is probably good enough. And again, this goes back to what I was saying that they've made tremendous advancements in the amount of bandwidth they're able to really use in the last five years. But if you really want to test your system and see how good it can be, um, if you're paying the premium service at $10 a month for say the Spotify pro or iTunes, or uh, even if you're using something like Tidal, um, I think you'll really get a, an idea of how that music was intended to be heard, you know? And I, I kind of go back to this analogy of you wouldn't go to a museum and only pay to see half of the painting, right? And a lot of times we do that with music, but again, mm -hmm. people don't know they have that choice, right? They, they, they don't know that what they're listening to is actually maybe a little bit degraded or compressed, like you said. Mm -hmm. and, and to go in a little bit further into that compression, and it, moreover, it's called digital compression, what that means is we're going to take the full bandwidth of the signal, say 20 hertz to 20K, which would be like the human range of hearing. And, and CD recordings go above 20K, but we won't get into that in this discussion. Okay. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, 
I've got this big file, but it only fits into a, you know, a pipe about yay big. So I got to throw things away, right? So what am I going to throw away? And it throws away elements from the bass, so it doesn't sound as rich. It throws away a lot of things in the high frequencies, actually, so things sound a bit dull and muffled. And when I do this exercise with my friends and family, when I subject them to this and I play the CD version versus the version they're used to hearing, everybody can hear the difference, right? But again, right. we're conditioned to say, well, this is what I've always listened to, so I assume this is how it's supposed to be presented. And, and to me, you know, again, Andre, going back to the discussion we were having before the shooting, a lot of the battle really is, is lost in one in the source that you're actually using. And CD players are, are going away in cars, right? And I understand why. There's the, they're moving mechanisms, they break, right? We can't really buy CDs anymore. I mean, when was the last mm -hmm. time you went to say uh, Best Buy, for example, and bought a CD? Right. So everything is on our phones. And, and there's nothing wrong with that by any means. Uh, don't be afraid of Bluetooth. Bluetooth is no longer a huge offender of sound quality. I think I, I get that question a lot. People say, yeah, I'm just listening to you Bluetooth. Like, you know, again, if I'm in my point you know, zero, 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 one percent of friends who are like the ardent audiophile are going to say, no, it has to be connected, but I'm trying to uh, appeal to the general consumer. You know, someone who's like, look, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go to these links to buy these special cables, but I will do things that will facilitate a better listening experience if it's not going to cost me a bunch of money. And so again, I tell people, don't be afraid of Bluetooth. If you've got a, a Spotify account app or iTunes, that's great. Um, you know, satellite radio for, for a while there was something that uh, was highly compressed if you had it on the tuner side of it. So if you actually went into your radio and activated it, they mm -hmm. have since moved to an application service, which I think uh, it sounds tremendously better as well. So the industry itself is increasing, right? The way that we consume music is actually doing a lot of us a favor. Um, but, but yeah, still just be mindful of the settings as you go into your app is what I would, would tell people. Uh, if you're going to pay the premium service, I think that's, that's great. You know, obviously, um, if you're not, uh, you might have some other options within that app to be able to make your listening uh, um, experience a bit more enjoyable. Okay, that makes sense. Um, before we move on to kind of the branding uh, topic, um, what about the actual utility uh, of a vehicle like the Ram truck? Uh, we we went over this a little bit uh, before we started recording uh, the mm -hmm. show, but um, other elements like weight uh, is very important. You <laughs> talked about placement, right? You talked about where do you put the speakers or the subwoofer or whatever uh, amplifier. Uh, but what about a vehicle like a truck where every pound that you add to it, you cannot carry, you know, something uh, a, like a useful payload, basically. Yeah. So, so how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, I think I mentioned that I know for a fact that these guys go into meetings when, and it's all about saving one pound. I mean, they might even have a whole day's worth of meetings about how are we going to save a, a single pound? And that's a real challenge for us because speakers can be heavy, especially when you start talking about subwoofers with big enclosures in them. And I think we all know the benefits of a subwoofer. I'm sure most of your viewers would, would also agree that, yeah, it'd be nice to have a sub if I can get one. The problem is subs like a lot of air, which usually means they like to have big enclosures attached to them, right? To be able to, to play down to the frequencies to make it even beneficial to having a subwoofer. Well, that takes up mass. It takes up weight, right? So um, we've developed- And, and space. In, in space. space. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it goes back to, we've got safety features in the car. We've got features in the car that are just there to, to make the car perform. So we can't assume that the subwoofer is going to take over a lot of that. So, um, I mean, I guess just as a bit of a plug for us, we've developed a subwoofer technology called an externally coupled sub. So instead of using this big, large enclosure, right, and say this eight inch subwoofer attached to it, we actually couple the subwoofer to the outside of the vehicle. So using the, all the air available outside of the car actually as the enclosure. And, and it's hmm. obviously saves on mass, saves on weight as well. So we're having success with that. Um, when it comes to placing low frequency drivers, so like your six by nine woofers, maybe six and a half woofers, those are the things that are actually low, below your knee in the door typically, right? And we do that because as a human, it's very, very difficult for us to localize where bass frequencies come from, right? So again, bass being like the kick drum, the bass guitar, low frequency note instruments. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we can put those really almost anywhere in the car and you're not gonna notice that, hey, the bass is behind me or off to the right or the left. And then we move on to the placement of the mid-range speakers, right? So those are typically going to be up on the IP or the instrument panel, the dashboard uh, is another way to call that, or high in the door. And now these are directional. These are the mid-range speakers, right? These carry things like the vocals and the guitars, uh, percussion. We want to make sure that those are raised up 
and actually at eye level, because this goes back to that spatial element we were describing about seeing the sound. And if those things are too low in the door, now all of a sudden all your sound is coming from the floorboard, right? And that's not something again that uh, the artist, the producer intended. It's not something as a high quality branded supplier that we want to present to the public either. And then there's the tweeter, right? Finally, the tweeter is the smallest speaker and it's going to play the, the highest frequencies, again, the air of the space that's kind of in the recording. And we want to put those up high as well. Um, for those uh, who are familiar with 3D surround systems, you know, I think you've probably been maybe listening to a couple of vehicles in the last year that actually advertise 3D surround sound. Mm -hmm. That means we're putting those tweeters up in the headliner of the car itself or high up in the A pillars. So we're raising those up above the head of the occupant and creating kind of more, almost like the roof coming off of the car is the idea there to transport you into the environment that which this recording took place. And you know, recordings don't take place in cars. They obviously take place in, in large rooms or Large, large auditoriums. So we want to be, the, be able to simulate that environment uh, to, to the consumer as well. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Um, I'm learning a lot. So thanks, thanks a lot. Good, good. Uh, yeah. yeah um, and um, the other aspect I wanted to kind of bring up. So what if you didn't buy that expensive truck, let's say, mm -hmm. right? So what, yeah. if, what if you didn't buy the Ram Limited um, and yeah. you have another system? Um, I think you touched on this already, but how do you know um, that it's actually worth the additional cost because some of those systems do cost additionally um, versus the base system or whatever, sure. whatever the base stereo is. Yeah, sure. So typically if there's a three tiered approach and, and we're assuming that the top two tiers aren't say uh, a branded one and branded two, like say a Harman Kardon option one, Harman Kardon option two, uh, what you're typically looking at is say, um, you know, four speakers, four full range woofers, probably six by nines with what we call a whizzer put in the middle of, of the cone. And, you know, it's going to do its best to be able to play from say 20 hertz, again, the lowest bass frequency we can, we can uh, hear as humans up to being 20,000 hertz, which is the highest treble frequency we can hear as humans. But it's just not going to be able to do that because they're not that efficient, right? And asking a speaker to do all of that, I mean, is really the holy grail, <laughs> which is why we have to combine woofers with mid-ranges with tweeters because that simply makes them more efficient and more able to do their jobs, essentially. But when you get a bass system, that's what you're probably going to get. And you're still going to hear the melody and the beat in your music, but it's not going to be as exciting, right? It's not going to be something that probably emotionally moves you. Uh, but again, if, if that's what you're conditioned to, I think you'll be surprised when you hop into the next step up, which is typically what we call a non-branded premium system. So now you're taking those four full range woofers and probably adding maybe two tweeters up, say in the dash or the sail panel of the car, mm -hmm. and maybe even a center channel in the middle of the dash, or possibly even a subwoofer in the back. And you're going to notice uh, probably the biggest bit benefit there is a spectral and Enhancement. So again, spectral goes back to that bass, mid-range, and treble balance. You're going to hear more of the bass notes in your favorite music. You're going to hear more of that air, that space, that detail in your favorite music from the tweeters as well. And with that center channel being put in the middle of the dash, you're probably going to get a sense that, oh, there's more of the singer now in front of me. But whether he's in the middle of the car or, or maybe she's over the, the center of the steering wheel, you're going to get more of that what we call spatial acuity, being the stage width and, and where you perceive those images to appear in front of you. Um, but really where the, the real oomph, if, if we say the real bang for the buck comes in, is when you go up to the branded system because what these non-branded systems lack is the DSP power. This goes back to us talking about that ability to sit in the car and, and truly manipulate each one of these speakers right in an optimal way. Mm. And they have some of that ability. Uh, they won't have oftentimes that delay capability. So that ability to say, for example, those front woofers are located really close to your legs. The subwoofer typically is located somewhere in the back of, of the vehicle, right? Mm. If you measure how long it's going to take for that subwoofer to arrive at your ears versus the woofers, well, the woofers are going to arrive first. So what we're going to do to align that subwoofer with the woofers to make sure your bass is nice and punchy and full is we're going to tell those front woofers, hold up for a second. I got to wait for the subwoofer to get about halfway up the cabin, and then we're all going to release together. And that's something that you get with a branded system, that customization that you just simply are not going to get with a non-branded or base grade system. And it's, it's probably akin uh, to, let's, let's consider your viewers here, you buy a nice audio system for your living room. Oftentimes, it just comes with an instruction manual, how to plug it in, right? How to hook it right. up. And then, yeah, you're on your own after that. Maybe you're doing some Google searching. This yeah. would be akin to having an engineer come into your home we'd say for up to three weeks and sit in every seat in your home, right? Time align everything, uh, make sure the frequency response is even across all those seats. I mean, that's something you don't really get when you buy a home system, but you get each time you buy a branded audio system. So I really want to emphasize that, that customization and optimization. So the next time that your, your listeners go and listen to a car on the lot, that's what you're getting with that. 
Yeah, and I don't remember exactly how much that you know premium RAM system costs, but uh, from our discussion here and hearing, you know, that it takes several years of development cycle, right? Many many man hours um, of actually tuning and right. developing. I mean, you can kind of see where that you know um, additional cost coming from, sure, and, in, sure. and the value you're actually getting um, if that's what you're prioritizing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you yeah. want that experience. Yeah, and also the look of it. We talked about the industrial design. You know, the grills available in the branded system are going to be significantly more elegant, if you will, than, say, the non-branded system. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the other brands? We talked about Harman Kardon. Yeah. Uh, what about some of the other manufacturers? Yeah, so uh, we have JBL, uh, exclusive to Toyota, right? So if we want to talk about, you know, the, the Tundra and the Tacoma programs there as well. Uh, we talked about uh, B&O, which is kind of the lifestyle brand uh, comparison to Bang & Olsen. So I think many, maybe you're familiar with that brand as well. Yes. Uh, Bang & Olsen is, is a luxury brand that we position exclusively in the Audi systems. Mm -hmm. And then we have, uh, again, B&O, which is more the lifestyle offshoot of that brand that we have exclusively to Ford as well. So we have that in the F-150 and the F-250 brands there as well. Uh, if we want to talk about going more into the premium side of things, uh, we have Mark Levinson on the mm -hmm. Lexus automotive side. And again, that's been exclusive to Lexus for probably, I want to venture to say about 20 years now, actually. I, I was going to say, I mean, I've seen yeah. uh, many Lexus vehicles. Mm -hmm. I was in an LX recently and I, I saw that system. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, funny story about that. And again, I think it might be kind of folklore, but I want to throw it out there is, you know, Mr. Mark Levinson uh, was an accomplished jazz musician. And then all of a sudden we have the, the most powerful amplifiers, right? American made amplifiers that were ever produced. And um, for years, automakers were approaching him to say, I want to put this brand in my car, right? And Mr. Mark Levinson would say, no, because the integrity of your car isn't good enough. And, and what I mean by that is, We've all hopped into a car and we've heard the buzzes, the squeaks and the rattles, right? I mean, it's really unavoidable when you're going to put that much energy behind plastic and sheet metal and those speakers start vibrating and moving the way they do. Things are just going to vibrate. That's just mm -hmm. mechanics. Um, eventually, he partnered with Lexus because he felt that Lexus was building a car that was structurally rigid and sound enough to minimize that. So essentially sounds more like a room where when these speakers start to move, the enclosure, right, that's surrounding that speaker doesn't flex with it, right? causing some of those colorations, if you will. Mm -hmm. so, so that's just kind of the backstory and kind of, a, again, a feed into something else to listen for when you're evaluating cars is, is that integrity, that, that buzz, squeak, and rattle that comes from systems that often masks that experience. Uh, but kind of moving on again through the brand. So uh, moving over into Europe, we have uh, the Bowers and Wilkins and Harman Kardon systems in the Volvo. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, we have Harman Kardon throughout BMW as well. Um, so people often then say, so how do you separate the sound signatures of all these brands, right? right. That might be a question that you're probably going to come up with as well. Right. And yeah, we, we certainly have sonic characteristics, right, that are associated with each one of, the, of these brands as well. And that kind of comes in more to the subjective testing. Um, our engineers and our marketing team work to create a, a, a brand signature, a sound, if you will, right, for each one of these brands that we believe fits that brand, that characteristic. Um, to make sure that we're actually hitting that. So the engineers might say, for example, gosh, for JBL, we'd like to have a bit more bass and maybe a bit more vocal forward. So the, the mid-range might be a bit boosted. So they're going to go and tune that car the way that they think it should be done. We're then going to bring that car into the benchmarking lab, right, where we have these trained listeners. They are going to listen to this system and sight unseen because they're not prompted to know what it's supposed to be, right? We've covered all the badges in the car. They're going to listen to it. And then based on their comments and their feedback, are they hearing more bass? Are they hearing more of this vocal forward sound, right, that we're trying to advertise? And if they're not, then we're not meeting that signature, right? Then we're not creating that unique JBL sound that we were trying to. And then with each one of these brands, they also have a heritage in the home, right? Every one of these usually has a home product that we could draw from. Uh, Revel, for example, is another one of our brands. It's a, a high-end American loudspeaker company, uh, and they are exclusive to Lincoln now. Mm -hmm. And Revel is, is, a, is a company, right, that prides itself on uh, no, no sacrifices. They, they want to be able to deliver the music as you heard it in the studio, right? We're not going to make any compromises, which is why they cost probably anywhere between $2,000 and, say, $30,000 for a loudspeaker. <laughs> but they utilize a, a technology called point source architecture, and that's built into every Revel home speaker. And what that means is where we're positioning the tweeter with the mid-range speaker physically, well, the way they throw waves out into the room, 
-hmm. if, if those aren't in line with each other, right, then they're going to basically interact with each other in a negative way and cause some cancellations and distortions. So they've developed the patent process in their home loudspeakers that we also implement into the cars. So when you buy a Rebel system in, in a Lincoln product, it also has that point source architecture put into it. And so I oftentimes get the question that, you know, well, you're just white labeling things or you're probably just carrying over the same products, you know, into other car lines. And that's absolutely not true, actually, that we do engineer each one of these brands to carry that DNA with them into the system, right? So you're not just buying, you know, everybody gets a JBL product or everybody gets a Rebel product. When you buy this brand and you're familiar with that brand, you should get a signature sound that you're used to hearing if you enjoy the home product as well. Yeah, I remember several years ago, I was in an Audi A8. Uh, we were doing a review on the car and um, I pulled over, I think it was in my neighborhood and uh, I was talking to my neighbor <clears throat> and uh, he said, you know, what, what kind of stereo do you have in this? This is a luxury car. I mean, it's yeah. a really high end yes. uh, machine. And I said, well, it's Bang & Olufsen. Um, and he said, well, w wait a minute. My, my other friend who has this very expensive home mm -hmm. has a Bang & Olufsen system in his home. Sure. How you know, he he didn't know you know obviously not everybody is an automotive expert right Yeah you're sure sure uh, yeah. but 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 you he was able to connect and say wait a minute I recognize that brand you know it was my, yeah. my, my other friend has this in his very nice house and and now you're telling me you have this in your car Absolutely so yeah. so I think that's really uh, you know at least one example that I, yeah that. Yeah, it helps. And, and it's it actually, it's a lot of fun. Well, so we'll use Bang & Olufsen as an example because they weren't always a part of the Harman family. And the first time I heard of Bang & Olufsen uh, system in that A8, it might've been the same one. And we're talking probably over 10 years ago. Yeah. It had the pop-up tweeters, right? You turn right. on the car and the tweeters yeah. almost presented themselves. They would rise up out of the dash and like, almost bow, if you will, like, I'm, I'm ready to perform for you. That was something that was so unique in the industry. No one had dared to do that, you know, before that time. Mm -hmm. But that was when we saw this paradigm shift of not just about sounding good, but also looking good, right? Being something that's a total experience for, for the user and something they can also just be proud of. And they turn on their car. It's pretty cool. Of course, it wows their kids as well. Like it's a spaceship, you know, kind of, kind of thing. Um, but Bang & Olufsen in general has really prided themselves on being something that's visually appealing, right? If you look at a Bang & Olufsen speaker, you know it. It just has that look to it. It's, it's mm -hmm. something special. It's like a piece of art you put in your living room. And so getting, getting to work with them now, being a part of the Harmon family and seeing a lot of how that DNA works, it's really special actually because we can't make certain compromises, right, that are going to ruin the aesthetic look just to make it sound better and vice versa. We also can't make it look really good and ruin the sound. So there's always that, that push and that pull with certain brands and that's a unique one that's actually a lot of fun to work with in the background. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, I wanted to touch a, a little bit on the Ford system. I mean, the F-150, mm -hmm. um, the F-Series trucks are the most popular trucks. And, and was it a couple of years ago where you introduced the B&O Play yes. uh, brand? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We've dropped the play. So it's just, just B&O now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so we've had that partnership with Ford now. Oh gosh, I might get this wrong, but I, I want to say we're looking at about five years now, maybe, maybe okay. with them on that. And so we, we are across the entire line uh, in the U S and, and in Europe with that, uh, maybe possibly getting into Asia with it sometime soon as well. Uh, but, but yeah, that's, that's also been fun because we talked about automakers that are making audio a pillar. Right. And Ford has been one of those automakers. And uh, when you're talking the same language, you know, when, when you have engineers that are calling you up who are audio enthusiasts and, and people who are very excited about bringing in a new brand and working with you on creating that style, uh, it's a lot, a lot of fun. And I feel like you get a lot more accomplished, you know, when you have people on your side that are working with you in that aspect. And, and we found that with, with Ford from day one, they've been a real joy to work with. And I imagine, I mean, there are other challenges. We talked about, you know, placement, weight. Uh, but but now you're talking about the most popular truck in the country. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now you have a production volume, right? Yes, absolutely. So, so yeah. I don't know how many thousands of systems you sell in, in, in the Ford truck, but that must be another challenge. Yeah, it, it's it, there's a ton of them, obviously. But, you know, I think that, you know, we were prepared for some of those manufacturing challenges. And if anything, you look at it as an opportunity. Like, you know, this is your chance to introduce a world to a brand they've never heard of. Many people in the U.S. have actually heard of Bang & Olufsen. Um, and, you know, I mean, for better or for worse, people would often reduce that word to say B&O. But we really distinctly market those brands and engineer those brands to be very different from one another, have different characteristics. And again, I refer to B&O being more the lifestyle brand and Bang & Olufsen being kind of more the, the luxury side of it. Um, so we go to great lengths to do that. But it was a... Uh, 
it was kind of a lot of fun actually to go to some of these dealer events and introduce a lot of the dealers and, and their buyers essentially to what the Beano brand really was, you know, because uh, they came from a brand called Sony, right? Which everybody knows Sony. So mm -hmm. the brand awareness was very strong. Um, so what we focused on more was getting them in the car, getting them to hear, right, what we're bringing to the table, getting them to hear the Beano sound and all that DSP and, and the delay times or thing that we talked about earlier, being able to hear kind of what our, our vision is and our expectation for sound quality. And it's just been a lot of fun to put people in the car play some music walk them through the things that you and i've been discussing and seeing how they react to it you know in 17 years of doing this job i have to say that i still get a kick out of sitting in a car uh, at a dealer with a journalist a consumer someone who says look i love music but i'm not sure that i'm truly hearing the things that you're hearing and just simply just give them the confidence to walk through their audio system in a way that they can confidently enjoy the system feel control over what they're manipulating when they move a fader of balance or they hit a surround sound or adjust the bass in their system and i'll, I'll never probably uh, lose uh, my sight for enjoyment, right? Of, of sharing that passion with people and then watching how they react to hearing their favorite music for the first time. And B&O was like that uh, from day one, whether it was with the, the Ford individuals in Dearborn or whether it was going to some of these, these dealer training meetings. Yeah, that's very cool. So uh, just to summarize, so what I've learned today mm -hmm. um, is um, a couple things. So um, I think one thing I can take, or two, two major things I can take away is, First of all, kind of the source matters. I mean, yes. not every source would be a high quality, um, talking about compression or lack right. thereof. Um, so this, you know, if you're paying attention to that, you know, if you're streaming it through an app, Bluetooth is okay. So I learned mm -hmm. that, um, yes. so, so th thank you. But also <laughs> what I think, and I've, I've tried this before, is when you're turning up the volume and you're actually going past half, yeah. maybe even more, um, let's say you in that day where the windows are down yeah. and you're going fast on the highway, um, you don't want to lose the, kind of the crispness of it or the kind of the, the structure of the music while you keep going up and Absolutely. up and up. And, yeah. and, and to, to, the, to the experience where you talked about kind of the harshness of it. Right. Um, so, yeah. so those are some of the things, I guess, um, simply at the simple level, right? Yes, that that, yeah. that person can think up about. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, and again, it just, it makes you feel more empowered now when you listen to an audio system to know that I'm looking for these three things. I think oftentimes we overcomplicate it and assume that everyone's going to care about the same things that we do. And if we've done our job in the background, you shouldn't have to worry about those things essentially. And that leaves you to worry about, gosh, I'm really trying to enjoy this music, but every time I go past this volume, it kind of like hurts a little bit. It sounds a bit harsh to me. And it physically bothers me to do that. And, and now you know why, essentially, because the amplifier is saying, gosh, I want to give you more juice, you know, but if I'm going to do that, I can't give you more bass. I'm going to give you more mid-range and more treble, which again is going to make that stick out to your ear and, and, and cause a little bit of that, that, that physical discomfort that you have. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I've also seen, and I've done this also, um, a lot of new vehicles have USB ports, right? Yes. So you can have, yeah. a, little, you can have a little flash drive, mm -hmm. let's say with your you know, playlist or whatever you have, maybe. Um, you can actually stick it in um, into, into the console, and now you kind of have that source auxiliary, Absolutely. right? Yeah. So yeah. would you recommend that as well? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. nothing wrong with, with USB. Uh, again, Bluetooth, USB, uh, a lot of systems come with an aux port. Uh, sometimes the aux port, you know, that's just like a one inch, one inch eighth or one eighth inch cable that you would yeah. plug into, say, uh, your phone to there. Sometimes those aux ports can actually be pre-tuned, as we'll say. So they might actually, before you even apply DSP to it, they might have a roll off in the high frequency, meaning it might sound a bit dull, maybe even have a boost in the bass. Again, this is just sometimes. So just be aware of that, that if you use that source, it may sound different than maybe some of your other sources because it may have been again pre-tuned by the, the supplier before being put into the vehicle itself. Yeah, and I think um, as we already showed in this uh, episode is that all vehicles are becoming, uh, you know, they have more options. Uh, trucks are becoming family vehicles also, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. years ago, decades ago, there were kind of work vehicles, very specific um, for yes. some jobs, yeah. but now they're day-to-day -day vehicles. So, um, and the, I, I'm, I'm glad that you said that you can actually preserve some of that quality in one of the harshest environments, which is yeah. a vehicle. It is, right? it is. Yeah. Because it's a difficult environment to be in, <laughs> but you know, you guys are putting in the work to actually preserve some of that quality yeah. in that environment. 
Yeah, well, we believe that that's where you're going to reach, you know, the, the most listeners. You know, I, I think we, if we look at, like, say, Nielsen research, you know, every year it's showing that music consumption is growing. And we think that that's because, again, of people's access to streaming media, which goes back to the Spotify, iTunes, things like that. And that's a good thing. Right? It's a good thing for us as music lovers and more people are consuming it. And we also find that, again, the young, younger generations are preferring to listen to music in their cars more than their home. It's not quite surpassed that, yeah, that yet, but I think... As time goes, that might end up being the case. But either way, uh, I think I made the, the comment that how many people have 19 speakers in their home, now you have it in your car. I right. think it goes across most branded audio car lines, right? I mean, speaker counts are getting higher and higher. And I mean, even if you have nine speakers in your car, if you have nine speakers in your home, right? that kind of a thing, right? So right. I, I think if you're looking to reach you know, uh, the most listeners and to do right by again, the artists, right? That we're here to essentially to promote and the engineers and those guys who work very hard to create this music. Uh, we need to understand that where are people listening to music? Right? And, and a car is, is really kind of become, becoming that place where we can preserve some of those principles that we were talking about earlier, like spatial reproduction, right? And the spectral balance more effectively than say doing it in people's homes where people buy a loudspeaker, put it in the corner, and just by placement alone, you might actually be, you know, uh, distorting or coloring the sound. Where in a car, uh, while it's kind of a pain in the butt sometimes to have to, you know, spend a month in it tuning it, once you've tuned one, you've tuned them all, right? So then every, uh, we'll say RAM that comes off the line should have that same sonic signature. And then you're just basically passing on the joy, right? To all these people, everyone who goes to buy one. That's very interesting. Well, Jonathan, thank you for joining me on this episode. Oh, thank you, Andre. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Good time. All right. And uh, of course, uh, guys, this episode will be everywhere that podcasts are distributed and also on YouTube on uh, TFL Now channel. So thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. 